We don't have good solutions right now. What exactly is AI? What, how, how is it working and how do we expect? Humans are not good at analyzing data. As we are approaching the end of the 20th century, what happened is computation became cheaper. So we have more computation power, we have more data points. We know that students who are only doing online courses are not doing that well. They need to have the human interaction also. Clearly, it's not easy. It's not easy if, uh, in 2023 to be a student. Why? No one really knows how which professions will be generated within the next 15, 20, 30 years. Well, first of all, thank you for being in my office and uh, doing this. My background is uh, basically mixed. I have a background both in computer science, initially as a computer engineer by training, but then I switched into uh, finance and uh, uh, business. So even though on a first uh, look, those two specialties seem to be different, actually they converge as we go forward in 21st century. So we know most of the business problems need to be dealt with a computer and computation. So these two disciplines actually are not as dissimilar as it sounds in originally. So in any case, my background is a joint background of computer science and business uh, methodology, business analytics, and especially with emphasis in finance. I got my first uh, engineering diploma from a uh, university in Greece, engineering school of uh, computer engineering in, uh, in Greece. Then I went to United States, University of California, Berkeley, uh, with a fellowship to study computer science. And I studied my graduate studies in computer science. Then I graduated from Berkeley with my first graduate degree and then I switched into finance, financial uh, uh, economics, and I continued my PhD studies in uh, University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton Business School. After I finished my PhD, I continued on an academic career with uh, University of California, this time as a faculty. And then I continued teaching in various universities in the uh, US and uh, mostly in Europe. Uh, the last few years, I'm uh, mostly into academic administration, what I would call academic administration, which is basically this type of position, either vice rector, now I'm a rector of Webster University here in Tashkent, but I'm still an academic at heart. Well, AI, artificial intelligence, is uh, without a doubt uh, the big elephant in the room, so to speak. We expect that uh, most professions actually will change as a result of uh, utilizing one way or another some type, some type, some type of uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning methodologies. So uh, let us step back a little and think about it. What exactly is AI? What, how, how is it working? And how do we expect, if we can say something about how do we expect it to change uh, the world and also the way we uh, understand the world. Uh, well, if you go way back into how humans started thinking about science and learning, uh, initially we had a few data points and very limited computation power. So humans had to basically devise, let's say, stories. We had to figure out stories. Why? Because humans are not good at analyzing data on a massive scale. And also we didn't have data. So we had very few data points. Data points were expensive and we didn't have storage. And also computation was expensive. So we had to devise stories. Stories meaning basically what? We also say that we, we also call them models. Models and stories are kind of the same thing, actually. Model is something that somehow abstracts from, from a multidimensional reality to a more limited dimension reality that we can comprehend, we as humans. Now, 
As we are approaching the end of the 20th century, what happened is computation became cheaper. So we have more computation power, we have more data points. So now we are slowly shifting out of this modeling into more and more statistical and let's say econometrical and an algorithmic evaluation of reality. That is still, we are still at the end of the 20th century. The major though break with the beginning of the 21st century is that we have massive data points now. Why? Because whatever we do is being recorded. We as humans and everything that happens around us is being recorded. We have thousands of cameras, even in this school or any other place in the city. You walk, you are being recorded. You talk on your phone, this has been recorded, it's been analyzed. And, uh, and I'm not saying in a necessarily bad manner, but the thing is that we generate a huge amount of data points. At the same time, we have an immense computing power. Computing capability is rising very fast. So this merge of a lot of data points, while at the same time we have a lot of computing power, give rise to the so-called artificial intelligence and machine learning paradigm. Now, it may sound something really new, but in reality, actually, machine learning ideas were there even in the late 80s, early 90s, where I was doing my master thesis in the uh, University of California, Berkeley. But at the time, as I said, we didn't have a lot of data, we didn't have as cheap computing power as we have today. Today, we have the capability to analyze those data. So we are shifting away from a few data modeling approach to a massive data modeling approach where we allow now the computer to do the modeling for us. So instead of trying to model a few data points with some curve that tries to approach those points, now we allow the computer to somehow fit this massive scale data, uh, data collection, let's say, and try to minimize the noise in the system. Of course, there are critical questions here that tend to this discussion, like what is noise and what is information? And also, how much do we want the computer system, the artificial intelligence or machine learning system, to fit the data? Because the more you fit the data, the more possibility there is that you may be also trying to fit noise. So how much do you want to fit the data? How close do you want to fit the data? Which is also bringing us to the next question, like of in-sample versus out-of-sample fitting. Is it better to explain the data you have in your disposal, or is it better to try to be good at the data that you haven't seen yet? So you can imagine we are entering a very interesting and very exciting era of uh, computation, of data analytics, and I would say the bigger picture of how we approach a generation of knowledge, if you want. It's true that uh, education is a very, has entered the last, uh, I would say, 10 years, an accelerated pace of introduction of new technologies. Of course, the AI we talked about already, but also the advent of so-called educational technology, which is basically the uh, coupling of uh, human-based instruction, but also computing methodologies, is generating also a new paradigm of uh, how knowledge will be transmitted and how courses will be delivered across the planet. Now you can, for example, have a very good professor sitting somewhere in California teaching students here in Uzbekistan or vice versa. So suddenly the old paradigm of a professor going into classroom is uh, changing. Now, we need to be careful here because there are good ways of changing and bad ways of changing. What we need to do as, uh, as uh, uh, education professionals, we need to do the best merge of new methodologies, new technologies, but at the same time, we need to do that with respect to uh, a proper education for students. For example, to give you an idea, we know that students who are only doing online courses are not doing that well. They need to have the human interaction also. So we need to somehow merge 
the old world with a new world? Well, how, how would I advise uh, young students and uh, young people in general uh, to approach this new uh, fascinating, exciting, but also uh, volatile and uh, sometimes anxious world? Clearly, it's not easy. It's not easy f uh, in 2023 to be a student. Why? Because, uh, as we said, new technologies are coming and there is no way to stopping them and they will change to some degree, all professions. That is something we cannot escape. So a young student now has to think about uh, what does that mean with respect to his or her uh, preferred profession? How is that going to combine with the new technologies? It's not easy to tell. No one really knows how, which professions will be generated within the next 15, 20, 30 years. It's Im almost impossible to, to forecast how, what path technology will take, because we know technology, by its very nature, is disruptive. So you cannot really, you, you can never predict. So how do you prepare then? If you cannot predict, what is a good way to prepare as a student? Well, there are some things you can do. First of all, clearly, you need to be technologically savvy. There's no doubt about it. You need to be able to follow what is happening in new technological developments. You need to think about how is technology shaping and changing my profession. That's number one. Number two is you need to think about the big picture. I would say you need to think of yourself more like, not like a mechanic who is making an, an engine, but more like a pilot who's flying a plane. A pilot who's flying a plane doesn't really understand how the plane exactly operates in every little detail, but he knows how to read the instruments that he has in front of him, and he knows by reading instruments to generate a smooth flight, right? That's what you expect from a pilot. So student also has to think this way. The student has to think, okay, I'm not going to be the one probably doing all details of, for example, some data analysis. But I need to know the platforms that are out there. I need to know how to utilize those platforms. I need to know how to interpret and explain the findings. So student needs to take a more abstract, more high, if you want, the 30,000 feet view, rather than get into a lot of details sometimes. At the same time, another interesting approach as a student, you need to think about so-called, wrongly I believe, soft skills. I call them power skills. What do we mean by that? Skills that are not necessarily entirely job specific, but skills that you may take from one job to the other. For example, your ability to organize a meeting, your ability to process corporate information that is not very specific to a particular department of the corporation, your ability to read financial statements. Those are skills that are uh, easy to translate from one industry to another. Now, of course, at the same time, you also need to be more specific sometimes. You need to learn more specific, job-specific skills, what, what we call hard skills. So you need to combine, you need to play in both uh, games if you want. That's my advice to a student. Absolutely, this is a, this is a very recent, a very recent phenomenon. The ability of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning platforms to generate uh, essays and written uh, written material that is very uh, similar to human generated material is actually something that is perplexing us. <laughs> Frankly speaking, making our uh, lives uh, more difficult as educators because now we need to deal with this, but we need to deal with this. We cannot, we cannot hide our head in the sand and think that it doesn't happen. So we need to think about ways of, of tackling this. I, to be honest, this is a very recent phenomenon. I know in most universities around the world right now, people are thinking about ways to deal with this issue. Uh, how do we make sure that what is being uh, submitted by a student is generated by them. Frankly, I think some methods, some systems will come to actually do it mechanically. This type of validation will probably also happen mechanically. That's my 
hope and at the same time, if you want my, my vision for the future, I think that some mechanical future, some AI also future, uh, systems will effectively battle and find if something that has been submitted is uh, generated by humans or not. Another approach I believe will be that we will enrich our testing and examination approach. So we will probably have to think in various other aspects. So instead of student only submitting an essay or a paper, uh, we may have to do more on a one-to-one -one or maybe uh, test-based examinations where it will be more difficult for students to avoid having to actually uh, perform on their own. But this is definitely a very hot area right now that, uh, I'm, and I'm sorry to say that we don't have good solutions right now as we speak. How would I choose university if I was a student? That is, that is a, a very interesting question. And that is also something that will, uh, I will draw my answer to that question on what we said already. That is basically that we need to think not only of uh, hard skills. There is many, you know, uh, universities that uh, will give you hard skills. Uh, even if they're not well known, sometimes there may, may be good uh, instructor that will teach you, for example, a particular programming language if you want to be a programmer or a particular uh, accounting technique if you want to be an accountant. But what you will not find in all universities is a more round, a more global uh, an integrated, if you want, approach to learning, which is what we try to do here at Webster. What we try to do here at Webster is not only to prepare you by endowing you with uh, hard skills, like programming languages or uh, um, analyzing financial statements or data analytics, data science. Yes, we do all of that. But at the same time, we try to give you the power skills, the soft skills that will allow you to become a more uh, if you want a global citizen, you allow, will allow you to be someone who will be a lifelong learner. So you will be able to deal with the uncertainty and the volatility that lies ahead. That's how I would approach the very interesting question of what university to choose from.